Welcome back. And uh, now we are going to see how uh, the lateral flow assay works. The most important lateral flow assay that work, it's naturally the pregnancy test. This is the most used worldwide. This is the most studied. Uh, this is extremely important. We will see piece by piece how this one works and why it's it, it is so important. You can already see here that it works using many different parts in the paper. It uses usually nanoparticles and the chemical way how this works, it's called ELISA. So the enzyme linked immunoabsorbent assay, ELISA, or as Hamilton would say, Eliza. by the way, if you didn't watch Hamilton the musical, you should. How this ELISA work? There are multiple ways how this can work, but the most common is the sandwich assay. So you have antibodies, these antibodies can react or can recognize a specific antigen and then on top of this you are flowing uh, a sensor. So this one is the one that will give you color. Now it can be a nanoparticle, it can be a fluorescent molecules, it can be multiple different things as long as you have a signal at the end. This is why it's called sandwich because you have one part that is attached on the glass or on the plastic or in this case in paper you have your analyte in the middle and on top you have your uh, your sensor the molecule that will give a signal if something happened it is extremely useful because it's super versatile so how you want to use a lateral flow assay it's mostly up to you if you can bind something on paper and this this molecule can recognize your analyte you are good to go you can use this one for your specific analyte so, for example, in this case, I can put on paper a single strand RNA and I want to detect my analyte that it's another part of RNA. When they flow together, they will recognize, they will form a double strand, and this double strand can also bind the nanoparticles on top. The pros of the lateral flow assay is that usually they are really cheap. They are fast because you just need to put a droplet, the droplet moves, and then you have an analyte, so it's really fast, and it's super sturdy. So not only I can put my line for detecting the analyte, but I can also put a line for control. So if everything is fine with the lateral flow assay, I will see my control, my control showing up. On the cons, usually the limit of detection is really low. I cannot detect very low amount of analyte because I need still to see it, so detection is by eye. And most of the time it's only, only qualitative, so I have a yes or no answer which is perfectly fine with pregnancy test. I want to know if I'm pregnant or not. I cannot be pregnant at 50%. That doesn't make any sense. So depending on how you want to use it, it's perfect to have only a qualitative sensor. And I cannot do multiplex. So with only one drop, it's difficult to make multiplexing on paper. This is not completely true and we will see at the end why it's not completely true. I can do multiplex on paper. Going back on the central question how the pregnancy test works. We have, I told you that we have different parts in the lateral flow assay, and now we are going to see one by one which parts are those. So the first part is the sample pad. This is where you put your analyte, this is where you put your liquid, and this is extremely important for sample pretreatment. So if you know which liquid are you putting, you can treat the, um, the sample pad in different ways. For example, you can change the pH. Uh, you can have binders for salt. So, you are, so if your liquid has a lot of salt, you can remove them in this first part. You can change the viscosity. So if your liquid is too viscous, you can add more liquid in this pre first part, and then you decrease the viscosity of your liquid. This is where all the sample pretreatment happens. You can also use binder for other molecules. So, for example, if you want to remove some molecules from your sample, here you can add some binders for binding that molecule, and then your sample is, let's say, cleaner. Then we have the conjugate pad. The conjugate pad is where your reagents are. So in the first part, you put your liquid with your analyte. In the second part, in this small part here, you have your reagents. So they start mixing. And if you have a reaction, for example, a supramolecular interaction between your analyte and your sensor, this is where it happens. You see that it also has a weird shape. It's not a continuous line. 
and this really helps in mixing the different liquids. So your liquid with the analyte and your reagents, you have those kind of two curves just because of simple mixing. Also in this case, you can put some polymer for binding something else. You can put some uh, scavenger for salt. You can also give a last chance of uh, cleaning your sample. Then we have an analytical membrane. So this is where you put your sensor and your control line. This is where the ELISA will happen. And usually this part here is not made by normal paper, but most of the time is made by nitrocellulose. Can you guess why? We will discuss this on Friday. And then you have the wick. The wick part is just for not letting the, the, the liquid overflow after uh, your detection. This is just a safety for absorbing the rest of the liquid outside. I told you that it's very difficult to making multiplex and this is the reason why I want you to study this paper. This paper is pretty amazing because it's multiplex and it's multiplex in a very smart way. Instead of using different sensors for different color, they use a single nanoparticle that it's silver nanoparticles, but depending on the size of the nanoparticles, you may have different colors. So the nanoparticles, the, the material of the nanoparticle is the same, but you have different color just because the nanoparticle is of different sizes. In a few minutes, they can detect the yellow fever, the Zika, and the Ebola on a single strip of paper that costs probably less than 20 cents. I think it's pretty impressive. As you finish this part, you should be able to see why paper sensors are so amazing. They are cheap, they are super sturdy. So why we don't have paper sensor for everything? And this is a question that you should think about and you should come up with some answer or ideas on, on Friday and see you in the next video.